Who was the best player you ma ever managed at Tottenham? Difficult. Modric was fantastic. You know, Gareth Bale was amazing. Ledley King was a great centre half. Rafa van der Vaart was a fantastic player. They had that ability just to slow everything down, and it was like different little stages of, of, of film almost. Simply stunning! Were you upset that you didn't get the England job? Do you think that was that one job that you would have loved to have had just oh, one yeah, opportunity? Yeah, I would have loved to have managed England, yeah, yeah. for sure. When you're the manager, you pick the team, you make them decisions. You know, you feel like people are looking at you and like, oh, you know, it really, you, you can't switch off. It's it's not a great deal of fun. It's just, uh, you know, that's how it is. You you, you know, it's, uh, it's a pretty lonely job when it's not going well. Harry, how you doing, buddy? Dodge, I'm good, yeah. Good, mate. Good, good, good. Lovely to have you on the show. Pleasure. Nice. So let's um, let's get cracking. Let's go all the way back. You know, you've managed 1,400 games. You've done everything in pretty much in football. But let's go back. You've been married 50 years to the lovely Sandra. Where did you first yeah, meet? And was it love at first sight? Um, I don't think Sandra fell in love with me at first sight. <laughs> no, I wouldn't have thought so. <laughs> uh, but... Uh, no, I was just seven, just seventeen, and uh, they used to have a dance at the uh, Two Puddings Pub above the pub on a Sunday night, a little <laughs> disco. And me and my mate, who was a goalkeeper at West Ham, Colin McAuliffe, Macca played actually played in the first team at West Ham. Um, we said we've someone said was that there's a disco upstairs on a Sunday, so we went, and that's uh, that's where I met Sandra that night. So it was that a bit what fifty six years ago, I think. Now. Was it? Yeah. Wow. What's the what's the key to a successful relationship like that? I don't know. She's just been different class, really, mate. Yeah. I've got to be honest. I don't have a minute's aggravation, never, and I mean that. She's so placid, and we just get on great. Yeah, that's you know, amazing. we really we really do. I mean, we go. I don't go on holidays with other people. Just I I, I love her company. Yeah. I, I'm not not afraid to say that. Yeah, you know, yeah. we we get on great. So she must have seen like the highs, the lows, oh, the pressure. She must have seen everything. Oh, she's been through it, hasn't she? <laughs> She's been there, yeah. She's got the t-shirt, definitely, yeah. mate. She's she's been with her through thick and thin. And what and what was it like? Was she? What was it like back then when you, obviously you met? You were a superstar at West Ham with Bobby Moore and Martin Peters and Jeff Hurst when they won the World Cup. Was she a part of that scene then? No, she never had been to football. Never had a clue. Never <laughs> had a clue. Never seen a football. Had no interest. Uh, Dad had no interest in football. Really, he was a docker, big docker, lovely man, uh, foreman down the Albert Dock. Uh, a brother was not interested in football at all. Really. really, he was a rugby like rugby. Loved his rugby. Big fella, Brian, um, and her sister Pat. You know, it was amazing. Really, that two girls who had no interest in football worked in a little hairdresser shop in Barking. Um, and about a week after, two weeks after, I took Sandra out. Frank Lampard came in one morning. He said, oh, "I went out. With, I've been taking a girl out. You, you've been seeing her sister, Harry. You know." And I didn't, I said, who? he said, uh, Pat. And it was like, he met her separately. And uh, again, she'd never been to football. And even when we played, they never used to come. Really? Now they'd work on Saturdays in the hairdressers when we, you know, we were sort of courting from 17. And so, no, it wasn't like they were a couple of groupies. Who, Is it not? <laughs> no. <laughs> they never had a clue when, you know, no, not, not a clue about football and what, or West Ham. What was it like when you were playing back then? It's obviously, it's changed massively, as you know. But were you, were you lot on the beers the night before a game and stuff? No, not the night before, no, no. never. No, I mean, that was, people, you hear people say, come up with them stories. No, I think that uh, after Wednesday night, you didn't go out. I mean, there was one one incident, one there at Blackpool, <laughs> where the players went out at West Ham because what had happened, I think, they, you know, they'd gone to Blackpool and uh, every game in the country was off that next day with the snow. And the pitch at Blackpool, I think it was under about seven inches of snow. And they said, well, the game will be off tomorrow. And I think Bobby and a few of the boys went out for a drink that night to Brian London's club. I don't think they were late. They got back about 11, but they went in about a couple of beers because it was. they said, look, the game will not be on tomorrow. There's an inspection at 10 o'clock, but yeah. it's a certainty it'll be off. Anyway, they end up rolling the snow and actually played on the snow next day and, uh, and got well beat. So, <laughs> And it made the papers that they'd gone out the night before and it was, it was a, a big story. But no, in the main, um, I think we were pretty dedicated. You know, we liked the drink. We did used to... We'd be around the black line on a Saturday night after a game. We, you know, we we did enjoy a night out, but um, not not after Wednesday night. Yeah. No. 
And was it a special place for you playing at Upton Park under the floodlights at West Ham? Absolutely amazing, amazing place to play. Incredible, that old chicken run when I first went there. I mean, I, I left school at 14, uh, just before my 15th birthday and signed for West Ham. Um, you know, and that chicken run was just amazing. It was like a wooden shed, really, when mm. you look back on it. And it was when you you wonder how it never actually had, they never had a disaster yeah, there. Right. Like lots of, um, unfortunately, Bradford City did. But that was another one because it was just wood and it was piled that six foot high yeah. underneath it with paper yeah. where people just dropped cigarette yeah, packets and whatever. How no one never dropped, you know, a match didn't go down there and set the lot of light one day, I'll never know. But, uh, you know, when, when the team was going well, the, the crowd, they'd sway and sing, I'm never blowing bubbles. It was an incredible sight. It was a great place to play. Yeah. yeah. I always used to stand on the South Bank or the North Bank or the Chicken Run. Yeah, and yeah. the Chicken Run, as you're saying, you could someone could be taking a throw in. You could actually pull his shorts down. Oh, that yeah, close. yeah. It was, yeah, <laughs> you're that close. You could hear every word, believe you me. When it wasn't going well, you'd get some stick there. Did you ever have a mullet back then? Tight shorts yeah, mullet? It, I suppose we all did, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was how it was, wasn't it? We all had plenty of bar on it, but... Uh, <laughs> But they were great days because we all went, you know, we'd all come to the same backgrounds. Every player at the team really was, we didn't buy any players, West Ham. Everybody came through the youth team. Is that right? Yeah, it was the youth, you know, the, the kids we produced. So every year, I mean, if you look, Bobby Moore, Jeff Erz, Martin Peters all came out the youth team. Trevor Brookin, Frank Lampard. Um, they bought Billy Bonds from Cholton when he was about 17. That was a rarity to buy anyone. Um, and the rest of them, Roddy, Boyce, whoever you mentioned, they all mm. came all came through the youth policy, Amazing. you know. So you were playing there for years. What Did you ever have the fear thinking, what am I going to do after football? Or did you always have an eye on management? No, I, you know, I think when you come out the game, when I, I, I moved from there to Bournemouth. John Bond was the manager of Bournemouth and I played with John at the end of his career uh, at West Ham. So I knew John very well. He ended up being, uh, came to Bournemouth, got the job there and, and, and came back and... Uh, and I ended up coming to Bournemouth to play with John. But when I finished, you know, I went to America. Um, but before that, I really, coming to the end of your career, you think, what am I going to do? Yeah. I'd never had a clue. I mean, I was going to buy a Bournemouth taxi, uh, but it was <laughs> four, £14,000. I never had the money. I couldn't afford right? it. And no. what year are we talking here? That would have been around about 1977. Is that right? Okay. Yeah, I had a big knee problem and I was struggling really to play. You know, it, it, I'd been to every specialist trying to sort it out, but couldn't get it sorted. And um, suddenly you think, well, where am I going to go? I've got no education really. I mean, my dad worked in the docks. That was all I'd have ever done, yeah. worked in the docks. Yeah. So a Bournemouth taxi was the only was an option for me, <laughs> but as I say, I didn't have the fourteen grand. I wow. couldn't find. I, I nowhere near had enough money. Wow! So you took over Bournemouth. You were there for ten years. Mm. What was the highlight of that ten years when you were there? Well, getting promotion probably. Yeah. You know, uh, they've been hundred. People forget Bournemouth have been hundred years in their history. Never been out of Division Three or Four. Yeah, right. Never in their history been above. Div they'd been in the bottom two divisions mm. all all their history. And I, you know, so that year when I, you know, I'd only been, when I, we were top of the league and people used to say to me with 10 games to go, we, we know you won't go up, Harry, you know, we know you won't go up. I said, well, why is that? They, well, the council won't let you. Yeah. And, you know, they had this silly old wives' tale. That they, I went, well, you think they're going to come in the dressing room and say, sorry, lads, you've got to lose today. Yeah. I mean, I said, but, well, but no, nah, but we know, we've, you know, it's been, un we've never been out this division. It's not going to happen. Anyway, we won the league. Uh, and it was that was a fantastic oh, thing amazing. for me to do. That was, uh, you know, getting promotion at Fulham uh, with one game to go, and then last game of the season beating Rotherham at home to uh, to actually win the title. Lovely to go up with champions. It was it was a great time. For nice. Me. And you had you had you had uh, your son Jamie playing for you. What was it like hmm. when you sold Jamie to Liverpool, selling your son to Liverpool? Well, that was, it was difficult, you know, <laughs> but uh, because what had happened with Jamie, as a schoolboy, he could have gone to any club, you know, everyone chased him. We agreed to go, he was going to Tottenham, actually. Uh, Terry Venables was uh, taking him to Tottenham. He'd agreed he'd sign schoolboy forms. And then about eight months before he left school, he said, I don't want to go to Tottenham, I want to come to Bournemouth. I said, no, you, why? He said, well, I want to play. He said, I don't want to be sitting in their youth team the next three years. Yeah. I used to come training with me, so I think I can get in your team. I want I want to play league football. Uh, and I had murders with Tottenham, to be honest. I fell out with Terry, uh, who I'd gotten ever so well with, Terry Venables. He wasn't happy. I remember going up with, you know, to meet him. 
in his office and we had a big bust up, a big argument about it all, but there was nothing I could do. Jamie mm. didn't want to go. He, I said, what can I do about it, you know? Yeah. So he came here and played here, got in the team at 16, and then um, sure enough, it's, you know, Kenny came. I said, Kenny, he's already... Had Kenny the, Douglas. Yeah. yeah. I said, oh, he could have gone anywhere anyway. Kenny just didn't want to... He wants to play. He don't want to come to Liverpool. That's why he came to Bournemouth. He could have gone to Tottenham, West Ham, Arsenal, Chelsea mm. when he left school. I said, but he wants to... He said, well, he will play. I said, Kenny's not going to get in your team. He's just 17. Just, He said, he will play. So I'm going to build a team around him. Uh, and that was it. Once he said that to Jamie, we decided, yeah, yeah. and he went for it. Went up there. Um, I think he was only there. They had the cup games with Everton, a couple of tough games where they drew with Everton, had a replay, drew again. They were incredible games. In between that game, uh, I think they had one league game, and Jamie was sub. Uh, he was only just 17, so he was sub for and them days. I think you probably what probably had two subs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It wasn't like today yeah. when you have so many. Um, and sure, so he was on Kenny. You know, had him in his mind to get. He was going to be in the in around the first team for sure, and then Kenny resigned. So within weeks of him going there, Kenny had gone. No way. So it really left him. In a di <laughs> Suddenly, Graham Sooners came in, and I remember Jamie saying to me about four or five months went by. He said, "Dad, I don't think you know. You know, even knows who I am. You know, Graham. He said he's." You know, he's got the first team. He, I'm just a kid. One of the, he probably looks at me, don't know where. I'm. Um, and then suddenly, out of blue, he um, they had a European game away to Auxerre, and he wrote me up with some. I'm playing tonight in, uh, against Auxerre in the U uh, European Cup, and that was it. So Graham picked him, put him in the team, um, and that, yeah. So it was, it, and it turned out a great move for him. Wow, yeah. must have been ever so <coughs> ever so proud. What are your thoughts on when uh, they all turned up in their white Armani suits for the FA Cup final? <laughs> yeah, it was. I think that was Jamo's idea. David James, he's always been eccentric, but uh, I think Jamo got him into the. Uh, yeah, it's all right if you win, isn't it? You've yeah. got to win. <laughs> if you win, no one says anything. You get beat, you get slaughtered. Yeah. So that is a, that is the thing about it. Yeah. Probably, I didn't think, probably think about getting beat, but yeah, not a clever move looking back on it. <laughs> so you had 10 years at Bournemouth. What, how did the opportunity come around about signing for West Ham? Um, well, I just got a phone. They'd got relegated and they asked if I would go there and, and I went there as assistant with Billy Bonds and uh, and we got we got up the first year, got promoted. This is mid-90s, it? 94, yeah, 95, yeah. Yeah, yeah I was yeah. Uh, very, very involved like with everything there, you know, and uh, so, yeah, and then uh, the following year we were struggling, bottom of the league and then I, I ended up, Billy resigned and, and I took the job and you know, stayed there. You know, the next uh, next seven years or whatever I had yeah. there. You know, I had a great time there. Produced lots of good young players. Yeah. That was the first thing I did when I went in there was to uh, look to improve the, the, the to get the kids back in because that was what the club had done. That's how we'd established ourselves as a great football club by producing players. And I think for about 11 years prior to that, we hadn't produced a player. Is that right? Players had come in and played a few games and gone and come, you know, there was no one really since Ince, Cotty. McAvenny. No, I mean, they bought Frank. They yeah, bought yeah, Frank, yeah, you yeah. know, but the kids who come through the youth team uh, they hadn't produced a player really since since that little group. Potts, so, Stevie Potts. Yeah, Steve Potts, he was a class player, mm. wasn't he? Well, so, so the, the the golden era that came through then, you had your Frank Lampard, your yeah. Ferdinand, your Joe Cole, your Michael Carrick, they all come through when you were there. Yeah. And then you added a load of glitter on top with the Paolo de Canio. Yeah, yeah. Like, what was it like? What was it like managing those lot then? It was great. I mean, but the kids especially, I bought a fellow called Jimmy Hampson in as a as the youth development officer because I remember we played, I'd only been a few weeks in, at the club and we played Cholton in an under 13 game and I think they beat us 5-0. And I said, well, how can Cholton really have better kids than us? It didn't add up to me, you know? Uh, and, I, and I said, well, they said, well, this fella here gets all the kids for Cholton, Jimmy Hampson. He was, and he was, was having a cup of tea in the old tea uh, at Chabalief at the training ground. And he was there. And I went up to him, I said, you know, uh, you've done well getting, you've got some good kids. And he said, yeah. I said, listen, do you fancy, would you fancy coming to West Ham? He said, Harry, he pulled his sleeve up. He had Amherst tattooed on his arm, Quality. didn't he? He's on West Ham Med. <laughs> so I've come from Silvertown, just yeah, up the road. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'd love to come here. Anyway, I pulled, got him. Um, and then off we went, really. We then, we then got Jermaine Defoe, who was at Cholton, but we ended up getting him out of Cholton. Cracking player. Bought him. Uh, we got Rio, as you say. We got Frank. 
um, and Michael Carrick, who was up the northeast of England, Newcastle, Geordie yeah. boy. We used yeah. to bring him down during school holidays from the age of 12 and train and, um, you know, say, uh, Glenn Johnson. Probably the best player at the lot, the best schoolboy player mm. I think I'd ever seen was Joe Cole. Yeah, Joe was a genius. Yeah. He was uh, 11 years of age. There was nothing. Joe, Joe was just on another planet. Yeah, he, you know he'd play two years out of his age and just destroy every. Mm. We play Arsenal. We play Tottenham. Whoever we played, he could almost beat him on his own. Mm. He was that good. Mm. And you had Frank Lampard there, who was your nephew. Mm. Did you find yourself under more pressure as the manager from the fans that you were picking Frank? And did they feel like there was a bit of nepotism there? Or yeah, like I think. There, yeah, I think it seemed to be. I don't know why. His dad had been a great player. His dad was my assistant. Or my right hand man, Frank Senior, uh, he'd been a great player for West Ham for 20 odd years. And then suddenly his boys come through, West Ham through and through. I don't know, it didn't make sense no, to me I why people yeah. would be on his case, you know? Yeah. But listen, at the end of the day, he, you know, he did what he did on his own back. You don't go to Chelsea and play 100 and whatever, seven times or whatever it was he played for England. Scored twenty goals every year in midfield. Yeah. His dad, his dad or his uncle wasn't helping him then, was yeah, he? So, so we were. I was right. He was a fantastic player. You, you were massively right. Maybe I remember on, on Sky was. I think you were at a West Ham fans conference or something, and some fan was at you about yeah. Frank. What happened there that night? No, it was just a, a drag. Young, what had happened? I think Trevor Sinclair was supposed to come along with me that night, and Trevor couldn't make it, and I had a couple of. You know, the players never wanted to get in. They didn't, never wanted to do them things. They'd always find an excuse. And yeah. I got let down. You know, suddenly I think I might have had Mark Reaper or someone with me, but and I needed someone else. So I, I got, I dragged young Frank along. <laughs> run, was I 17 said, then? Yeah. And, you know, and so, and, and, and one of the guys started on him a little bit and, you know, had an opinion about he shouldn't be in the team or whatever. So, yeah, no, I fought his corner, but. Um, he certainly proved every. He proved me right, and uh, I mean his attitude was amazing. Mm. You talk about train. I mean every day he'd be out on the training ground, but everybody else had gone home. Mm. He'd be out there till it was dark, yeah. practicing left foot shooting, right foot, left foot, doing his sprints, doing his. He'd go home and run around the streets at yeah. night. Yeah. He was so wanted to be a player yeah. uh, that you know he couldn't fail really when you had that. That attitude yeah. and dedication that he it's showed. that relentlessness, is it? How unbelievable he was. It's like when you and I interviewed him the other day yeah. and you just saw that relentlessness. Even as a Chelsea manager, he's so focused and he puts more time and energy than probably yeah. anyone else. It's the same when we interviewed Eddie Hearn. He's yeah. obviously brought up with his old man and whatever. But yeah. He's relentless as well. So there's, yeah. there's, there's a theme going on there, isn't there? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. You've got you've to gotta be, you got to throw yourself into it. It's not just going to. Uh, it's a full on. It's, but once you get into management, that is. That is Full on, you yeah. never switch off. Yeah. You, you, there's never a time in the day where you're not, you go out for dinner with your wife and you're sitting there thinking about the team this mm. week. What about him? What if I play him? What, how are we going to get a result? You know, you, people are talking to you after time and you're in another, you're not yeah. even listening. Yeah. You know, um, that's how it gets. It's, it's all consuming. Yeah. Did you, do you find, like, you know, we've had this whole lockdown for six, seven, eight months. Have you had time to reflect and look at your West Ham days and go, God, I was under a lot of pressure there. Or did I really enjoy it? Did you enjoy the moment, or was you constantly thinking of the next game? When you won, did you get? Were you buzzing? And when you lost, were you down for a long time? How did yeah, it work? no, you, you no, you never really got much time to enjoy it. You know, if you won on a Saturday by six o'clock at night, you're thinking about the following game. Wow. You know, how am I going to get a result? I've got to go to Man City next week. Got to go to Old Trafford or so. How are we going to box up a team to go there and, and get a result? You know, and when you're not going well. You know, it's a pretty, you know, you'd be driving your car and you feel that people are sort of, you know, when you're having a bad time and the team are struggling, you know, you feel like people are looking at you and like, oh, mm. you know, it really, you, you can't switch off. Mm. It's it's not a great deal of fun, mm. I believe you mean. I know people, and we do get well paid, make, make no mistakes, the rewards are fantastic. But when you're not going well, it can be a pretty lonely job because... Yeah. Uh, being a coach is everybody loves the coaches. They go out, they take a bit of training. Everybody, every, everybody's power is not a problem. When you're the manager, you pick the team, you make them decisions. You know, when you leave someone out, they go on, they hate you. Their wife hates you. Their kids hate you. <laughs> their in law, their mum and dad hate you. It's just uh, you know, and that's how it is. Yeah. You, you, you know, it's uh, it's a pretty lonely mm. job when it's not going well. You've got this amazing gift of making people feel good. Where, where, where does that come from for you to get those players and make them believe in themselves, like that young squad? 
Well, I think people respond more to, um, you know, to a well done than what they do to keep being told what they can't do. I don't mean, and, and really a key little moment for me was when I was in America with Bobby Moore, you know, I was big pals, me and Bobby, and we went out one night for dinner, we were chatting away. And uh, he said, you know, Harry, he said, all the years at West Ham, he said, Ron never said, Ron Green with him, he never said well done to You're me. joking, mate. He said, um, and he said, and I think we all need a well done. We all have a pat on the back. And he was right. He's right. Mm. He said, maybe he thought I didn't need it because I was captain of England, captain of West Ham. He just took it for granted, you know, Bobby's. He said, but we all, and, and he's dead right. You know, see, when you do a good job and someone comes, hey, great job yeah. today. Well done. It's It means it's a lot. Of feeling, isn't it? Of course it is. We, so, all, we all need that. So when you look back at that, remember when Paolo Di Canio, the crazy legend for West Ham, mm. you know when he pushed over the referee that time? Was it that moment you thought, you know what, I'd love to have that player play for me? Well, no, I chased him. I'd always loved him when he was at Celtic. I used to watch him. And he reminded me of a little kid in the playground who was the best player and wanted to win. And and when the ball went out for a corner, he'd run over and take the corner. <laughs> he'd take the throw-ins. He'd take the free kicks. He was doing everything. He, was all, he wanted to win so bad. And he was the best... And, you know, going to Sheffield Wednesday then with West Ham and when we used to play against him, I'd say, make sure in that final third, someone latch on to him and don't leave him till yeah. we get the ball back. Make sure, do not let him get on the ball. Even if they've got a throw in, somebody make sure you st don't, don't let him throw it to his feet because he'll turn and he'll come and do something special. So I was such a fan of his, I just thought, what a talent, yeah. you know? So when he when he pushed the referee over, obviously it became a problem. <laughs> then Sheffield Wednesday, we got in, and I remember saying to Terry Brown, the chairman, I'm, you know, we need him. He said, yeah, we need somebody, Harry. I said, I'm gonna, uh, he said, who you got in mind? I said, Paolo Di Canio. He said, Harry, anybody but him, please don't. <laughs> no, please no. I went, no, he's different class. You yeah. Know. Anyway, I brought him in, and sure enough, he became one of. An absolute legend of yeah. West Ham, didn't he? he? Was a genius. Yeah. Was he easy to manage? No, very difficult. Was he difficult? But but I loved him, you know. But he he had days where he'd be uh, he'd be uh, you know he'd be almost impossible. Mm. He'd, he'd throw a tantrum and you know uh, he'd, uh, <laughs> fuck you, you know, <laughs> hey, don't uh, you know he'd off he go walk off or you know. Did he ever yeah. do that in the middle of a game or anything like that? Yeah, uh, yeah, we done it against Bradford, didn't he? That day when we played Bradford City, that's one of the great clips when he had three penalties that were penalties, and the referee didn't give any of them. Three times he got fouled, and every one of them was a penalty. Look, if you watch the film videos of it, and he didn't give give him one penalty, and in the end, the third one, he walked over to the touchline, went uh, sat on the floor in front of me, crossed his legs. Put his hands on his chin. I come off. I don't play no more. I don't play. Parlo, I'm saying, get up, Parlo. We're losing. We're losing, Parlo. We're losing 3 1 at the Bradford City, Parlo. Get up. He's going, I don't. And I'm going, Parlo. And I'm getting the ump now, like, you know. And suddenly the crowd started singing his name. He jumped up and the ball came to him. And the office, while he was sitting on the floor, Dean Saunders went through, went round the goalkeeper and missed an open goal to make it 4-1, and we'd have been definitely gone. Yeah. Anyway, he gets up, plays on, we get back to 3-2, then we get a penalty, three, and we end up winning the game. And he scored the penalty, him and Frank had the- Had, had the, a little fight, didn't they? Pulling the, the ball. ball. Yeah, 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 I remember. And Frank let him take it in the end, and um, and Paolo came in and stuck it up, and you know, made, made out a smash of the goal, he died, and he just chipped it into the <laughs> back of the net. I mean, Class act, right? Uh, yeah, but no, that was every day was yeah. it was interesting. Yeah, but he, he, what a talent! Yeah. When I see players on TV now, watch them, they go through, and they'll hit the, the defender will be coming across, sliding in last ditch challenge, and they'll hit the ball, and the defender will block it. Parlo would have gone like that to shoot, and they'd have come yeah, whizzing past back. him. He'd have chopped back and rolled it in the other corner. Yeah. And I'm thinking, you know, as a coach now, they should show some clips of him and Greavesy. Jimmy Greaves was the same, incredible. Jimmy would, everything would slow, when Jimmy got the ball in the 18 yard box, he'd go to shoot, there'd be bodies flying everywhere, mm. coming past him. And Jimmy's just moving the ball about a foot the other way and they're all whizzing past. And then he'd side foot it in the corner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They had that, that ability just to slow everything down and it was like, you know, different little stages of, of, um, of film almost, you know, 
in slow motion. It was just incredible mm. to watch. So what was that feeling like? Because I remember growing up as a kid, we'd be in the in the stands singing, Harry Redknapp's Clamp Blue Army. When you first started hearing that and you knew you had 36,000 mad West Ham fans singing that, what was that like? Well, it was great. Obviously, when, when you're winning, it's a lovely feeling, isn't it? You know, when you're winning and you're playing well, it's... Uh, it's a great feeling. It's the opposite, but then the ops. You know, when it's not going well, you get the opposite. Mm. But um, yeah, as I say, it's uh, yeah, it was great to go back to West Ham, and uh, you know, the, the memories from there. Even now, I still talk to some of the boys. You know, that I grew up with, and um, you know, we had a special group. I mean, there was we were a special lot of lads because we all came from within six, you know six or seven miles mm. of the football ground. So so from West Ham, you then moved to Portsmouth. Was it Milan Mandrovic? No, I came to. Oh, oh sorry, as a manager, yeah. As a manager, yeah. yeah. You yeah. Went, was it? Was it Milan Mandrovic? Yeah, Mil Milan was the chairman. He owned uh, Portsmouth, and I'd met Milan out in America when I was at Seattle. Um, Milan owned the San Jose Earthquakes. He was the. He'd have been the young. He'd have been about um, thirty-five then. Mm. A young young man, and he was businessman of the year in America one year as well. He wow. won the big accolades. Very, very, I think he employed something like 40,000 people in right? Silicon Valley. And he was a big, big owner, the, the big, powerful top, you know, even though he was a young guy, he was very well known yeah. in the North, North American Soccer League. He had, uh, George Best went out, he took, yeah, George yeah. played for him. What nationality was uh, Milan? He's uh, Croatian. Croatian, is yeah. he? Yeah. So he owned Portsmouth and he said, Harry, I, do you want to come and manage here? He, well, he went to, he, he was at Portsmouth. No, he, what he wanted was, um, he was looking for a director of football. And he rang me up. I'd left West Ham, finished up West Ham, um, and, I, and it, I went and met him. And he said, "Would you come here?" And uh, you know, I said, "Well, Milan, I'm not a director of football, really. You know, I said I'm a manager." Um, he said, "Well, you know, you you, you can come and uh, you know just help the manager." And uh, I said, "Look, okay." I thought, "Well, it'll feel, I'll do it as a fill-in until I get something else comes up." You know, it keeps me involved. And I went there and it was very difficult. It wasn't, you know, I wasn't a director of football, really. I ended up being, me and Milan would be going to the games, driving to the games on Saturday. And then with about four games to go, the team were in the bottom three, looked like we could have got relegated. And he said to me, Harry, you've got to get, we can't go down. You've got to, you know, they've been in the bottom four, I think the previous four years, mm. but bottom five, just missed out on relegation. And he said, you've got to take the team. I took the last three games and we we got a result, uh, a couple of points and we stayed up. Um, the following year, he wanted me to take over. I wasn't keen, to be honest. Oh, it wasn't right. on my agenda, really, to want to be manager of Portsmouth at that time. Yeah. But I took it and uh, was in the championship uh, and I thought, well, we ain't got a lot of chance, really, mm. going anywhere. They've been a struggling club, you know, fantastic fans, uh, great tradition. But the team had been poor, um, and then I brought Paul Merson in about three Class days before act. the season started. Yeah, yeah. Took him on a free transfer to Aston Villa, and he turned it. He was amazing. Yeah. He turned everything around yeah. for me, and I brought a couple of other good players in. You know, at that time, a boy called Harry Anders, who was centre half, who was mm. an absolute proper leader yeah. uh, from Wigan on a free transfer. And I put a team together, yeah, and we went off. I mean, we were 33 to one to win it at the start. We were the outsiders of the whole league. And we won our first game, uh, went to a beat, not Forest, went to uh, Crystal Palace for the second game, two nil down at half time, came back and won three two. And off we went, yeah. we, led, we led the league from day one um, and ended up winning the title. So it was a fantastic year yeah, to get, yeah, yeah. get promoted. And how long were you there for at the start, the first stint? I'd have been there uh, the following year we stayed up and then the following year we were going very well. And um, I just got manager of the month actually. And we uh, and I had a row with Milan. We had a bit of a bust up. Um, and that's when I walked out. I just resigned. And were you obviously the arch rival Southampton, they come along and said They came about a week I'd only been out of work about a week and then uh, they they rung up Rupert Lowe asked me to uh, want to meet me, offered me the job at Southampton. And I'd had a big argument with Milan, so I felt well why, why should I not go and work? Why, I don't ain't my fault. He's he he bought a director of football in uh, with who was that? that? He bought a guy called Zayic who was um was a great player, Yugoslav International was a friend of his, he mm. brought him in to be director of football. Okay. And I didn't, I had Jim Smith, Joe Jordan, I didn't need a director of football. Yeah, yeah. We were very experienced 
you know, group there. Um, Kevin Bond, it, we'd all been managers and did, so, did you realise when you went to Southampton that there could be a sort of a backlash with fans or anything like that? Or did you just think no, off the, I off didn't the cuff? think it would be like that. Yeah, I dived in. I'm a little bit like I sort of went, <laughs> you know, it came up. Oh, yeah, why shouldn't I go? I ain't done nothing wrong. I've done great at Portsmouth. Yeah. You know, uh, Milan's gone and, you know, told me he wasn't going to do it and he's bought in this side itch. So I thought, yeah, why not? Um, and I went there, but I didn't, re first day at the training ground, it certainly came home to me. I pulled up to turn down where they train and there was about eight lads from Portsmouth digging the roads. Well, they'd been waiting for me that morning <laughs> and uh, they had it all up on a, it painted all up on big lumps of wood. Judas calling me all sorts of no. names I and mean, they was, proper tough lads, I wasn't going to argue with them. No. <clears throat> they was there, and then about, about three or four weeks, suddenly I pulled up one day and they'd finished. Every morning they'd wait for me, give me dog's abuse. <laughs> and then suddenly they were gone, they'd finished their work, thank God. <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, it was... Um, Did you ever have the fear? Because you just don't know what's around the corner on stuff like this, with these football fans are getting over overexcited about stuff like this. Did you ever have the fear at all, going to training for Southampton or driving past no. Pompey or anything? Uh, no, not fear. It wasn't nice, you know what I mean? Yeah. I was getting, I had to change my number. I was getting the phone calls all, um, um, I had a thousand phone calls in a day. I mean, it was just nonstop, one really? after another, just giving me abuse. Well, someone had got your number and spread it someone out. Someone put my number yeah, out, yeah. yeah. And every, yeah, so I had to change my phone. Yeah. Um, it's a, yeah, it was a difficult time. Even where I lived, they used to come past on fishing boats, yeah. lads from Pompey and all shout abuse at me. When you're in the garden? In the garden. <laughs> You know, oh, it was non-stop. There was no escaping. So... Um, and did you enjoy yourself? Are they two different clubs? Pompey yeah. and South, are they completely different? Yeah, but people at Southampton were good to me. To yeah. be fair, I had no problems there. They were mm. great, made me very welcome. Mm. And it was just unfortunate. When I went there, they were in the bottom three. Yeah. And there was, there was four teams cut adrift. I mean, we were like, the four of us were way adrift the rest of the, t the league. And... Um, uh, you know, I know we all say oh, we was unlucky. It, it was as though everything that could have gone wrong did go wrong. Yeah. It was just an amazing, you know, we were two one up at home to Everton and Crouch has got the ball in their corner. We played deep into injury time and he's only got to keep the ball or get a throw in or a corner and he he ends up smashing it at the goal. The goalie catches it, kicks it. Now the ref's about to blow. Sent Duncan Ferguson flicked it on and uh, oh. the boy, the lad bent, volleyed it. And it went in the back of the net and the ref blew the whistle. Suddenly, that's how it was. We're two new up at home to Middlesbrough. The, <laughs> I'm about to make a substitution. He puts up three minutes on the on the board of an injury time. We're winning two nil and they get a corner. So I don't make the substitution. I thought, I'm not going to change. They've got a corner. They take the corner. Danny Higginbottom heads it. He's near post. Skims up his head into the far corner for an own goal, 2-1. Oh, they kick off and within 20 seconds, they get the ball back down in, uh, hits a 25 yard, and now it's 2 2. Yeah. That was how it went. Right. It was just incredible. In the last game of the season, we got Man United at home. We've got to beat Man United to stay up. They're, they're in the cup final the week after, and Fergie put his best 11 out, yeah. whereas normally he would have rested a yeah. few because West Bromwich Albion were playing Portsmouth. Mm. They were managed by Brian Robson, mm. who uh, very close to Alex, obviously. Yeah. And, uh, you know, he wanted to do his best for, for Robbo, probably. Mm. And uh, and Portsmouth, because I was, yes, and it was Southampton, they they didn't want to do yeah. their best for yeah, Southampton. Yeah. <laughs> they wanted to do their best for West Brom. Yeah. So they went there, they, they didn't try, they got beat. In fact, the Pompey fans turned up in West Bromwich Albion. Is that so, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, so, so after that stint, you went straight back to Pompey. How did that feel? Did you get this massive welcome? Because I saw like the elation from the fans and you just had this big smile on your face that you were back. Well, I'll be honest with you, Dodge. I went back and it, no, it wasn't easy. It was it was tough because the, the, a lot of them still had the ump that I'd left. Really? It, yeah, oh yeah. I mean, I had, it was make or break for me. Wow. I took a gamble, they were bottom of the league. All the good players I had had gone. All them players I'd left behind had all been bombed out. And they'd signed the worst bunch of players you've ever seen. I mean, they were rubbish. They, where they'd picked them up from, they was from all, all mercenaries who yeah. had absolutely hopeless. Yeah. They was poor. <laughs> and I looked, I thought, how am I gonna get out of this? My first game away, Aston Villa got smashed up. Walking off, there was a banner up behind the goal from the Pompey fans giving me grief. You're joking. Oh yeah, no, it wasn't easy. And then suddenly I'm looking at it. 
I went to Tottenham, uh, took uh, three players from Tottenham, uh, Noe Pamro, um, Pedro Mendes and Sean Davis. Uh, Daniel done a, di you know, buy one, get one free deal. Daniel Levy at Daniel Tottenham. Daniel Levy, yeah, yeah we yeah. went there and met yeah. him. And yeah. managed, I tried to get Darren Ander and that was who I went to sign, yeah. really. Uh, but he's, he, Darren had a deal um, in his contract that no one could earn more than him. Mm. So he nice contract to have, isn't it? If anyone came <laughs> into the football club, so you can imagine, they've had people there like Klinsman and that turn up, and uh, no one could earn more than Darren. Wow. So every time that someone come in, he's clever. He'd go up and have, he might go up twenty grand or so. Yeah. His wages, it's great, fantastic for him. So couldn't have fooled Darren. He'd have been great because he started at Portsmouth. And I thought he was a fantastic player. So, but we ended up with the other three lads, and I took a little player from Argentina called Delessandro who I tried to sign when I was at West Ham. I watched, him, watched him play with the uh, yeah, Argentinian under-20 team at Fulham against England, and he was the best player on the pitch. Uh, he, he, he was an, an international player for Argentina, but he was playing in Germany at Wolfsburg. And uh, the agent said to me, you know, we were talking about him, and I said, can you get him? He went, I think they might see, he hates it where he is now. He wants to get out of Germany. Um, but I said, well, would they loan him? We can't afford to buy him. He said, oh, don't be silly, Harry, how are you going to loan him? You know, anyway, eventually they came back and they would loan him with an option to buy him. So I took him on loan and he was incredible. Mm. And we went on a run. Um, and won uh, the FA Cup? No, the year after. But that year, from being bottom of the league, we, we had 18 points uh, after 28 games. Mm. So with 10 games to go, we've, we've got 18 points. Uh, and we went on a run and we got 20 points at the last 10 games Lovely. and we stayed up with 38 points. Lovely. Uh, we won at Wigan away to uh, to stay up. That was, uh, we, we went on an incredible run, you know, uh, and the, the spirit was great. The players, it, you know, from being on the floor, we just, it was an amazing time. Mm. And I would say that was probably my biggest achievement in management, I wow. think, keeping them up that year. It wow. was an incredible, you know, Turn around. It was a great escape. And what was it like taking Portsmouth and they they got fantastic fans? What yeah. Was it like taking them to the FA Cup final? Oh, it was fantastic. You know, um, so I'd gone back there, and, uh, and then Milan had left, and we had a new owner, the, the Russian coming, Gaidamak, um, who I didn't really know very well. I didn't get to know him really. Mm. Um, he was quite a very quiet man, quiet young fella. Um, but to go to Wembley uh, and to, you know, I remember the day, you know, we got to the uh, uh, the quarterfinals. We had, you know, a couple of results and then suddenly the cup draw Man comes United. up. <laughs> I'm playing golf with Jamie that morning, funny enough, at Sunningdale. And uh, it was a day off on a Wednesday or Tuesday or well, Monday or Monday, whatever. We might have played Sunday. Or... Anyway, the cup draw is coming through. So now I'm stopping, Jamie, the cup, I'm going to listen to the cup draw. <laughs> And uh, and it came through, uh, Man United away. <laughs> oh, no. I threw my my eight eye and went further than what I've been hitting the ball. <laughs> oh, I had the right arm. Oh. It's all you need going to Old Trafford. Yeah. You know what I mean? They didn't get beat. Quarter final of yeah, FA Cup. They don't get beat. You know. <laughs> yeah. I thought let's get to a semi final, get to Wembley yeah. at least, have yeah, a yeah, day yeah, out. Yeah. You know, because. Uh, but we went there and, and played fantastic and. Um, and end up beating them at Old Trafford, and then that was it. it was on our way. Mm, quality. And then from and then from Pompey, you went to Tottenham. Well, how, where, how do you deal? How do you cut deals? Is it like if you want a player, do you go to the chairman and say, "Chairman, I want to buy that player there, but he's going to cost under a grand a week. Can I have him? How does it work? Who well, you don't say? you don't do any, anything to do with the wages. You just you know if you see it, you talk. You might if you need a player, and you you, you say, "Is there any chance of getting?" I'd like to get him. I think we could do is, and if he says, "Yeah, I think, yeah, it's okay. Yeah, we'd like to." Do. But then it's up to him. He then deals with the with right. the, the agent of yeah. the player, and you, you're not involved in them negotiations yeah. at all. You identify, but even that's changed now. It's more and more players are being identified by uh, heads of recruitment or whatever they're called. You know, it's they've all got different names for it now. At all. Mm. Used to be called a chief scout, yeah, and now it's uh, whatever. And um, well, I find it, I find it weird that you might know a player from other clubs, but you're not allowed to speak to that player if you want him to come to your club on a text or a WhatsApp saying, "Would you well, like you to come to the club?" Oh, you, you do. do. Oh, yeah. yeah, you do speak. Yeah, to them. Oh, every deal's done behind. Of course, yeah. every deal's done. You know, you yeah, 
you know, you're everything especially you know you, you're talking to the agent of the player about getting him and they're ringing managers and yeah, yeah it's all done yeah done behind the scenes you yeah. know if they think you know me i mean i met eddie hazard um in paris uh you know when he was at lille trying to want to take him to tottenham i mean what a player he was hazard mm. what a player he is and uh but yeah, we couldn't get the deal done. You know, Daniel didn't want to spend the money at the time. He felt it was, you know, it was whatever. But um, so yeah, you what you you meet players and mm. sort of it all goes on. You know, <laughs> of course it does. When I had Modric, <laughs> when I had Luca Modric, I had a, you know, when I was at Tottenham with Luca and suddenly Chelsea were in for him and uh, you know it was quite ironic. He said to me, "Oh, you know, the the, the manager of Chelsea been ringing me every night." You know, which is. Was it, you know, I could have easily kicked off and really and uh, but it, Lucas stayed and played and was fantastic uh, and it was ironic that he's telling him not to play don't play on Saturday mm. the manager via Boas is telling him uh, don't play for Tottenham Saturday tell him you're not playing and refuse to play forced their hand he ended up manager of Tottenham when I left which was quite strange yeah. really when you look at it who was the best player you ma ever managed at Tottenham? Uh, the best player, top, difficult. Modric was fantastic. You know, Gareth Bale was amazing. A lot of good players. Ledley King was a great centre half. Without them injuries, Ledley would have been just absolutely yeah. unbelievable. So lots of lots of good players. Um, Rafa van der Vaart was a fantastic player. So yeah, look, we had some good players. What was so good about Bale that you that you saw? Uh, everything really. He had, you know, he's six foot three. He could run. Long distance, short distance, dribble, shoot, head it. He had everything yeah. really. He was a fantastic, mm. fantastic player. And you t and you took what Tottenham to how many Champions Leagues? Only two. Well, I was only there for three years. Great uh, achievement. Three full years yeah. and one when I went there first year. Uh, we only had two points after eight games, so it was difficult to make the top four. Mm. But we ended up finishing sort of sixth or seventh or whatever. Uh, but then we had uh, a couple of years Champions League and. Um, and then the other year we finished fifth, just missed out. Mm. And then from there, there's the whole talk with uh, was it Roy? Uh, was it Roy Hodgson in 2016? And when I was at Tottenham, yeah, yeah. I was, well, I was managing Tottenham. Um, no, it's way before that, wasn't it? It was. Uh, I'm For not great with dates, but it was when I was managing Tottenham. And um, yeah, when you were when you were when you were managing Tottenham, how did the England opportunity come about? Because I remember seeing like you were fourteen to one on to get the job. What, yeah, what happened there? Well, I don't know really. It was you know the job came available. Um, you know, I'd been through uh, through the court case, and when I came out of court at Suffolk Crown Court uh, and, and been found not guilty of of trying to fiddle about ten thousand pounds off of income tax, mm. which me and Milan Mandrick, and when you think Milan had paid. Uh, Paid hundred million in income tax that wow. year. I mean, why are we trying to fiddle ten thousand pound between us? I don't. Um, it was beyond belief how it ended up in court. Anyway, but when I came out of court, a Capella had resigned or been sacked, and the job was out. So everybody, you know, put me. There was me and Roy Hodgson really in the running, and I was sort of, as you say, massive odds on. And yeah. Roy was a big outsider, but uh, he got the job. But yeah. And it was difficult. I wouldn't say that I was sort of that worried because I was enjoying my time at Tottenham so much. I had such a good team and I thought, I had a team that I thought could have maybe gone on and really challenged to win the I Premier agree. League. Yeah. I thought I could win the league, just one or two additions here. Mm. Next year we can win, you know, we, we got a chance. We finished fourth that year. I thought next year we could possibly mm. challenge for... Were you were you upset that you didn't get the England job? Do you think that was that one job that you would have loved to have had just oh, one yeah, opportunity? Yeah, I would have loved to have managed England, yeah, yeah. for sure. You know, they're great players as well. Yeah. It was a great time to take it. You had all them, fan, you know, Gerard, Lampard, Rooney. Yeah. It was a great group. So, yeah, I would have loved to have had the opportunity. But, you know, when it don't come, what do you do? It's You, you, you get on with it and... You know, you you get. I was, I, I was lucky. I was still managing Tottenham. So yeah. I wasn't like the end of the world. Yeah, amazing, amazing. And when the when when it come about when you finished Tottenham and stuff, and when your agent phoned up and said, um, "Harry, would you uh, like to manage Jordan?" Were you thinking the same Jordan that I was? <laughs> yeah, yeah, pretty much. Yeah, it was. Um, actually, it was uh, blonde hair. Yeah, yeah. Something like, could I manage you? I said, no. I think I'm too old for that. But. Um, <laughs> No, it was Prince Ali rang me and I thought it was a wind up. Yeah. He's like, you know, Prince Ali of Jordan. 
And I thought, oh yeah, who's this, you know? Harry, I love it. it's Prince Harry of Jordan. Oh yeah, fuck off. You know? <laughs> Who is it? You know, someone's having a wind up. Uh, and it, it was him. And uh, so he said, would you come and manage two games? You know, and I went, yeah, of course I'd love to. So it was a great experience. I did enjoy mm. it. It was the first game we beat Bangladesh 9-0. <laughs> and I thought, my God, I thought it was Bar we were like Barcelona, you yeah. know. And then we went to Australia and uh, they they bashed us up 5-1, so <laughs> soon come back down to earth. But no, it was it was good, met some nice people and yeah. uh, I went with Kevin Bond, came with me. They they looked after us fantastic, really, really. He's a lovely man, Prince Ali, special person. Yeah. Nice. And then from the football there, where did the opportunity come about from being asked to go and I'm a celebrity, get me out of here? And why didn't you, why didn't you choose like, Come dancing or, or well, one of the dancing programs or dancing on went, ice. Oh, or... I, couldn't, I wouldn't go on ice. I couldn't <laughs> skate. Oh, I'd hate that. That would scare me. Yeah. But, but uh, no, they wanted me to go on Strictly. Um, and I said, look, I'm not, no, I can't dance. I wouldn't. And they end up sending her. Amy came down, one of the girls at the show. She's a fantastic young Welsh girl. Yeah. She came down with a production company and uh, and they, they, they wanted me to do. Uh, Actually, he said, look, let's go to Merrick Park. We've booked up a, a room to, to go and, uh, and and dance with Amy and see, see if you feel comfortable doing it. <laughs> I said, no, I can't. It's all people are playing golf. I believe I'm going to be dancing around with a young bird around Merrick Park. <laughs> I said, leave off. <laughs> anyway, we end up doing a cha-cha-cha around the kitchen. <laughs> and um, But no, it was not for me. I didn't fancy that. Mm. It was... I think it's for younger people, yeah. you know. Yeah, yeah. So, so did you know anything about I'm a celebrity, get me out of here, going, you know, you're going to Australia, you're leaving Sandra behind. What was what was the thought process when you were getting there? Right, just deal with it or what was going through your head? Yeah, just, I mean, I was, it was, yeah, I'll do it. Yeah, yeah. And then when it came round about a week before, I, was, I thought, no, I'm not going to go. I'm going to pull out. I remember playing golf again with Kevin and a couple of mates at uh, Ferndown. And he said to me, I said, oh, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to pull out of it, you know. He said, you're mad. He said, what a fantastic thing to do, Harry, at your age. What, what are you going to do all winter? November, what are you going to do? It's gonna, you know, you can't play golf every day. Mm. He said, what an experience. Go to Australia. Sandra comes going, well, yeah, said, yeah, maybe. I'll come out. I'll get voted out early. I'll go out and then we can go and have a little tour around Australia. Because you had to stay. When you got voted out, you had to stay to the end anyway. Yeah. You couldn't come home. Yeah and all the families who came there to stay to the end. So if I come out early, we're gonna have a couple of weeks where we can go and have a tour around Australia. Mm. You know, what a nice experience. Mm. That was the plan, but I didn't come out till the last day. And then when I came out that night, next morning they, they boot you out the hotel. Is that right? Oh yeah, you're out next day. How many yeah. days were you actually in the jungle for? Um, I think it was about 21. Yeah. And then you, then, but you're there a week before you go in, in lockdown, where you have to have a doctor come, a psychiatrist, and talk to you and make sure you're up together and, you know, and everything. And you've got a chaperone who's looking after you uh, for a week in a hotel, middle of nowhere. You know, you don't know who else is going in. You're in a hotel, some, you know, and I didn't have a clue. I didn't know one other person that was going to be in there wow. prior to me going in. Wow. So it's all a shock when you go in there, you know. But no, it was a great experience. I enjoyed it. They were, they, I met some great people. Mm. We still keep in touch now. Yeah, nice. And what what trials do you remember? I remember seeing you one in like in a coffin. Or oh, something. that was the worst one. Yeah, I hated that with <sighs> the rats. Yeah, there were about forty rats crawling all over me with snakes, and I don't like rats any. Mm. And you know, that, see, that's where I'll, you you don't realise when you keep saying, "Poor, I'm scared of rat. I hate rats. It's the fault of a rat." You know, I yeah. couldn't. And so the more you say it, they think, okay, Bosh, we'll have him. We're, we're, we're yeah. getting with the rats. He don't like rats. Yeah. So you've got to be careful what you say, you know. Um, but I didn't realise that. And they put you, yeah, it was, it was uh, that was the worst one. What did you What did you think when you come out? Because you went in there as a as a hero of football. Everyone loved Harry Redknapp in football. Every man in the country knew you. Did you realise how many hearts you touched when you, when you came out of the jungle with mums, nans, brothers, sisters? No, no. Never had a clue. Never had a clue what, uh, uh, you know, we went, we stopped off in Dubai, me and Sandra, and that was kept me going. So I was looking forward to that so much, getting five days in Dubai. We get to Dubai, we go out the first night, there's a big steakhouse there where the guy does the salt. Oh, yeah. You know, like the old swan yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
and it's, uh, it seats about 200 people. It's one of the biggest restaurants you've ever seen. It's full up, jam solid. And uh, I walk in, me and Sandra, and suddenly someone sees us, like full of English people it was, and they'll, hey, Harry, they'll, there's only one. <laughs> I'll start singing. Sandra went, Harry, what have you done? She said, I thought we was going to have a quiet life. <laughs> and uh, that was it, off it went. And then uh, someone said to me, wait, you get home, Harry, it's gone bananas. You wow. know, you're on the bloody tr underground and yeah. pictures of you on the underground. And I was, are you sure? Like, was, I didn't, you know, I didn't, I didn't realise it. Yeah. Yeah. But no, it was, it was amazing. But mm. people have been good and I met, you know, but as you say, it's been mostly women and kids. You, yeah. you now come up to me and talk to me more yeah. than blokes yeah. about football. How was it? Like 14 million people watched that program and everyone was behind you and Sandra come on, everyone was in tears and oh, yeah. it was lovely. What was the feeling when you actually come out? How did your life how has your life changed from being a football celebrity manager to how it is for the last couple of years? Well, yeah, big change. I say women, kids talking to you, but I talk to everybody anyway, Dodge. You know, yeah. I ain't no I give everybody my time. I like to think I'm nice to everybody. It don't cost you nothing. Don't cost you nothing. No, it costs you yeah. cost me nothing. To yeah. be, people want to talk to me. I stand and talk to them. Yeah. I talk to them for ages. Yeah. You know, why not? It's You can make someone's day by giving them your time. time. And that's what I do. I like to make everybody feel, you know, I hate people who are aloof and think they're above everybody. Yeah. I, I've got no time for them yeah. people. Okay. I think we're all the same. Some of us have been luckier than others. To, you know, I'm lucky being able to do and being in, in a position where I can can bring a bit of happiness sometimes into yeah. people's life. People want a picture, of course I would. I yeah. never say no. Yeah. Never ever would I yeah. say no. Yeah. Well, I'd go out of my way to, to do it, you know? Never a problem mm. to me. What a lovely trait that is. And I think a lot of the younger generation can learn from that. But yeah, I've always been the same, to be honest with you. You know, I used to get the ump. If I saw players not signing autographs for, for the punters at West Ham or somewhere, I'd get, I'd get, I'd say, oi, they put, go, you know, go and sign their books, go and have a picture, whatever. I think it's, yeah, that, you know, mm. it don't, don't cost you nothing. What opportunities have arisen since you've come out? <clears throat> you've had a lot of people over you doing a lot of adverts, you're doing this, that every day you seem mm. busy. Are you busy every day? Oh, yeah, all the time, yeah. Is it? I've been busy, busy as busy can be, yeah. And lots, had a lot of good time, a lot of mm. good fun doing stuff. You know, mm. it's been different, but it's been interesting. You and I have been busy the last couple of yeah, weeks. Yeah, been brilliant with the podcast yeah. and meeting people that people coming on that you'd never expect Amazing. to get on. Amazing. I mean, it's great people to what talk What a lovely to. feeling to to co-host with you mm -hmm. on the Harry Redknapp show with yeah. all these amazing guests. Who would yeah. have thought it? I know, I know. But uh, but no, I mean, it's been good for you as well, yeah, Dodge. I mean, how did you uh, how did you get started with this with the sevens? I mean, that the Bournemouth sevens that is you know such a fantastic event. Yeah. Thank you, mate. How'd you get that? What, what gave you that idea? Yeah, I was, well, I've been throwing, I've been putting on events for 20 years. That's my world. Yeah. I put 1,500 events all around the UK, to, you know, and then did that for 10 years. I had 12 parties every week in different cities all around the country. And then I come up with the idea, living down in Bournemouth, come up with the idea and thought, there's not a sport with music festival mm. in this country. There's lots of music festivals, as yeah. we all know, the Reading, the Leeds, the Glastonbury, but there's not a sport and music festival. So my sporting background, mixing with my yeah. my putting on events and promoting and whatever, and my contacts in the sporting world and whatever. So I come up with the idea one day, why don't I create a, 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 a rugby and netball with a music festival? Mm. So that was like 12 years ago. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. And it's just grown from there and it's grown into a <clears throat> into the world's biggest sport and music festival. You know, it's 30,000 people, 400 teams competing, yeah. flying in from different countries and around the UK. And we built up a really nice vibe and it's it's a, it's, 30,000 people in a field partying for three days. I know, everybody trip. talks about it. I must yeah. get there next year. Yeah, I think definitely. You, I I think think you, once we get out of lockdown, I'm there. Definitely. I think that'd be on the cards yeah, for yeah, me, yeah, wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah so I actually yeah. absolutely love that. And then, you know, having these, having this opportunity here, like a pandemic pivot to create a studio and create a podcast. Mm. You know, eight weeks ago, I didn't know what a podcast was. All no, of a sudden, no. I'm interviewing all these wonderful no, people. Good fun, yeah. Co-hosting with you. It's just, it's just, if you give yourself, give positive energy out, like you are saying before, you yeah. give that positive energy, you give people time and everyone's the same. Good things come to you. Yeah. You know? Yeah, of um so I'm absolute I'm absolutely loving it. And obviously we're we're launching the online events course for sports people. So we're targeting that sort of that sportsman who um, might be in their twenties and thirties, they get an injury. What are they gonna do? All yeah. they've known is football or rugby. 
what we're doing is bringing a, a, an online course, events course, where we teach you everything you need to know about putting on events. Brilliant. You know, you can learn that online in three months. And we're bringing all the best people in from around the country, all the best people who own festivals and yeah. commercial director at Chelsea and everyone in to teach you, you know, teach you. That's brilliant. Yeah. 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 Because, I mean, you know, that is a problem. When you finish playing, where do you go? You know, not everybody's earning the big money. Exactly. There's all them players in the large divisions who, you know, every week they play, they train, they know nothing outside of that. And suddenly, you know, they're, they're not earning, uh, it comes to an end. They've not earned enough money in Absolutely. their career to really do anything. You know, so they've been paying their mortgage, yeah. they, they, they live okay. They've exactly got to start that. again. But they're all like key person of influences. Those people playing in the championship or Div 1 or Div 2 in the football leagues, they're celebrities in their little towns yeah. or, or, or cities or whatever. They might as well make the most of it now and, yeah. and jump on and say, I can get into the events industry for the sake of a couple of grand. I can be in the most exciting industry in the world, which is the events industry. Yeah. You know, so if they did our course and it's just, we, we've identified a gap in the market and we're really excited to be launching in uh, February 2021 on that front. Brilliant. Yeah, so, no, so, so loving it. Gotcha. Moving on to your hobbies, horse racing. Mm. Tell me what links your love for horse racing. Is there similarities being a manager and an owner of a horse at all? Uh, well, it's expensive only horses. <laughs> that is the only trouble. But no, I, I had no choice to get into. I, mean, I used to come home when I was a kid. My nan was she used to take the bets off all the old girls down our street mm. for Cyril the paper boy. He was our he was our uh, he was our bookmaker. He would come round little trill. I can see him now. Little trill be out on. Always had a suit on, shirt and tie. Had, <laughs> little dapper, he'd come in, Star News and Standards, my nan would collect all the bets off the old girls down our street, Love put, it. wrap them in a little bag, three tuppenny doubles, a tuppenny treble, that was the normal bet, three tuppenny doubles, tuppenny treble. What's that in pound notes these days? Tuppence. Which is? Two P. Two P. Right? Two P. Three two P doubles yeah, and a yeah. two P treble. Right. And, you know, people forget, didn't they, when I was at West Ham, we used to get dinner vouchers, four shilling dinner vouchers. That's 40 pence. Wow. And we'd go into the CAF, the Kazataris, or we go in there and we'd have uh, we'd have steak pie, chips and beans, or peas <laughs> or whatever. We'd have jam roly poly pudding <laughs> and custard Love twice. It. Love it. And about two Coca-Colas and get change out of your four bob. Yeah. Out of four shillings. Yeah. People it's incredible, yeah. isn't it? And what horse races? What what race is your best of the year? Which is the one you get most excited uh, about? Oh, Cheltenham! I love Cheltenham. Cheltenham's special, you know. That is the festival, the national one, and I've got some nice horses now, so lots to look forward to there. But um, Sandra thinks I've only got one. Actually, she don't know about the other nine. <laughs> you got ten uh, horses. Yeah, quality. But uh, I do enjoy it, you know, I really do enjoy it. It's my hobby. It's your hobby, isn't it? And you're passionate about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. And I love that. And the golf, I love playing golf. I enjoy going to play golf. They're the two hobbies I've got. Who's, the, who's the little jockey who you thought was a jockey but wasn't a jockey? Oh. <laughs> Remind me of that yeah, story. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that was, uh, now I went into, uh, in, in, into a restaurant one night and uh, got introduced <laughs> to this little guy, um, Oh, like Lee, Lee, Lee Topless. Yeah, that's Sorry, right. Lee Topless. I'm cracking, yeah. <laughs> Lee Topless. He, and and uh, I said, oh, I said, yeah. It's, it's serious that Les Ambassadors introduced me to Lee Topless. He thought he was Lee Topless as well. And I said, oh, I said, you're doing well. You you know, you you ride for Richard Fahey. Yes, he said, I ride for Richard Fahey, yes. I said, what are you doing down in London? And I said, you're based up north and you're near first or somewhere, right up north of England. Well, I'm here riding work tomorrow, he said, for, for you know, I've got to go to Newmarket and they, they give me a, anyway, he's drinking red wine, Bosch, crash. <laughs> I said, you right, riding tomorrow? I said, you, you can't, that's still be in your blood, all that booze. I said, you'll get, no, no, I'm all right, I'll go and run around the track tomorrow. <laughs> anyway, this went on about four years, he had me. Harry, can you lend me 500 pounds? Uh, I've got to go to Dubai to ride work for Godolphin. I don't get my money for another month. And yeah, uh, yeah, all right, yeah, yeah, yeah. He had me, he had Satirius, he had a little group of us, you know. Uh, and it turned out he was, he'd never, he wasn't a jockey at all. He was, he used to collect, a mate of mine rings me one day. He said, Harry, you still talking to that Lee Topless? I said, yeah. I said, I'll take him to football. Here he comes, to, turns up at Tottenham. He, Chelsea in the director's box, I'll get him in everywhere, I'll keep lending him money, he gives me loser after loser. He said, but he's not Lee Topless, he works in a pub in Newmarket collecting glasses. 
He was a popman in the pub. Quality. And do you know he still rings me now? Uh, ask I still money. talk to him. No, I still talk <laughs> oh, to him. Do you? Yeah. Oh, brilliant. I laughed about it. Yeah, yeah. I laughed. It yeah. was funny. Yeah. It, it really, I look back on it and it was, he didn't do me any harm. Yeah. He was like a poor little lad. He was, he was, but it, it was amazing what he'd done, yeah. really. It was funny. And I, I got a bit, I laugh at, I think, what, Harry, he yeah. had you over there. <laughs> Stevie. In fact, he rung me yesterday. Did he? He rang me yesterday that, you know, to say how good Liverpool were on Saturday. Did you watch Liverpool on Sunday, Harry? I thought they were great. Yeah, yeah, play well, Stevie, you know. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm all right now. I've got a little, I've got a baby now and I'm all settled down and, uh, yeah. But no, he's, he's a rascal. <laughs> he ain't really changed. A couple of years ago when Tottenham got to the, Liverpool, sorry, got to the Champions League final in, was it in, in Rome? Mm. It was, yeah, yeah, with yeah. Tottenham. They yeah. Go. Suddenly they're, they're interviewing, the, 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 the news are there. The, I, outside here, it's packed here. This is the day before the game. It was in the middle of Rome or wherever the game was being played. Um, oh, he said, there's no tickets. It's crazy here. And, and he was by anyone got, a, have you got a ticket, sir? They went him. No, he said, I pay anything for a ticket. I'll give anything. I, I don't miss a game. I go every week. I just, I want a ticket. I'll pay anything if anyone can help me. And the newsman said, well, we happen to have a ticket, a free ticket. Oh, look, like, he's took that. He'd go off and sell it straight away. You know what I mean? <laughs> oh, I'm going, it's Stevie. I couldn't believe it. But no, he'll ne he won't change, really. Love it, love it. Ari, I could sit here all day talking to you about stories and I love being good. in your company. Good. Thoroughly enjoy good. it. And you're a proper good, good. man. Good, good. Dodge, it's been nice talking to you, mate. And uh, anytime, I'm always around, always available. You're a good man, Ari. Good. Nice one. Cheers, Dodge. Cheers, Ari. Thank you. Cheers, fella. <laughs>